Hi, this week I thought we'd look at the heart, um, but we'll look at the electrical conduction system of the heart. That is how our action potentials, electrical impulses created in the heart, how do they pass around the heart, and how does that then cause the squeezing of blood from chamber to chamber and out through major vessels, and how is it all regulated and controlled from an, anat from an anatomy perspective. But no doubt we're gonna get some physiology as well in here. Okay then, you may be aware that the heart is largely muscle and a specialized muscle, cardiac muscle, um, and it has four chambers and that muscle beats regularly throughout your life. And it has to be coordinated. So we have the right atrium and left atrium up here. Blood comes in from the superior and inferior vena cavae and the pulmonary veins. And then the atria contract, push that blood through the two atrioventricular valves into the ventricles. And then once the ventricles are filled with blood, then they need to contract and push the blood out of the heart through the pulmonary trunk in the aorta. Now we've seen a few interesting features straight away here. For one, the blood is coming in from the atria and going to the ventricles. But look, it's the blood when it fills the ventricles is going towards the apex of the heart, it's going out towards the point here. And yet these great big vessels here that are sending blood to the lungs or to the rest of the body are up at the top. So somehow we need to create a system by which the contractions in the atria happen first and that they happen completely before the ventricles contract and really we want the ventricles to contract from the tip upwards so they squeeze the blood back upwards because if they did it the other way it just wouldn't work would it? It would just, yeah, it wouldn't be very efficient. So how would you arrange the electrical conductive, electrical conductive, how would you wire the heart to do that? Nerve cells, neurons, can generate action potentials, as we call them, which is a depolarization of their membrane, an electrical impulse, if you will, and they can send that along their very long axon. So a neuron is a cell with a cell body and a very long axon. Now in the heart, we find myocytes, cardiac muscle cells, that are highly specialized to do something similar. And also, the cardiac myocytes, the muscle cells of the heart, are connected to one another in a special way that allows them to carry electrical impulses, action potentials across them from cell to cell, which helps them organize this wave of excitation, this wave of contraction, linking all the heart cells together to help organize the contraction of the atria and the contraction of the ventricles. So that's the first bit. Now, when I was doing physiology during my first degree back in the day, we used to do proper experiments and we would take the heart from a frog, take it out of the frog, put it into a Petri dish with some Ringer's solution. Ringer's solution is just a uh, solution. So it's water with sodium, potassium and calcium in it. Uh, the salts necessary to help muscles contract and nerves depolarize and things like that. So it's just simple salts in solution, buffered to a pH of about seven-ish. And the heart would sit in the Petri dish in that ringer's solution and would continue to beat for a prolonged period of time, demonstrating that its chemistry and biology, by, pro by providing all of the, the salts necessary for the depolarization to occur across the cell membranes of some of these cells, the heart would beat regularly on its own outside of the body. Also demonstrating then that it's not that the heart is wired up to the nervous system and the nervous system is constantly telling the heart when to beat, but that there are some cells in the heart which can automatically make the heart beat. And in the embryo, we see something very similar. The heart and the cardiovascular system, they're the they form very, very early. It's the first system to form, which makes sense because 
we need to supply blood to other organs and tissues and systems for them to grow, right? So the heart starts to form kind of in the third week and the fourth week and so on. Um, and when the heart first forms, it just forms as a collection of cells that when provided with the right salts will just contract on their own. It's just biology and chemistry. It's just the cells doing the thing they have been programmed to do, which is to trigger an action potential, which triggers other muscle cells to contract and the heart beats. But this seems very magical to us because we take the heart as when it stops beating, that signifies the end of life for many of us, right? So then does when the heart starts to beat signify the start of life? It's a very difficult question. I mean, if you believe in a soul, do you think that the soul enters the body when these cells that have just differentiated to do this job and been provided with the salts to do this job contract? And if you took them out of the body, they would still contract if you gave them the salts? It's a very philosophical question. It's a very human question. And this is the interesting bit, is that there are many possible ways of determining when life begins, but humanity has not agreed on one of them. So in biology, we used to teach that life begins at, now we teach that we don't know when life begins. <laughs> hmm, anyway, the heart. That was, there was a purpose behind all that, right? Because what we were largely talking about with all that was the sinoatrial node, or the sinus node, or the pacemaker of the heart as it sometimes gets called. And this is a little um, see-through model of the heart. Um, oh, I don't know if I can see it on here, but um, if this is the right atrium, the sinoatrial node is up here. So, right atrium, superior vena cava, where the superior vena cava enters the right atrium, up in there we find the sinoatrial node. And if the heart is special, this is an incredibly special region of the heart. These cells here are modified myocytes and they will depolarize like neurons, but they, they, like, um, they, just, they produce an action potential and then they start depolarizing straight away. And they just keep, when ready, they'll produce an action potential and then they'll prepare for the next one and they'll produce an action potential and they'll prepare for the next one, they'll produce an action potential. So they're regularly putting out electrical impulses all on their own. So they're the ones that are responsible for the things I was talking about just now. They're the ones that are responsible. For, so if you took the heart out, they would make the heart beat regularly. And in the human, um, most of the cells of the sinoatrial node will depolarize, they'll produce about 100 action potentials a minute, which would make your heart beat at about 100 beats per minute. So that all starts up here. It's called the sinoatrial node because in the embryo, we have a whole bunch of veins coming into the heart and that kind of forms a sinus. So this is kind of in the, in the flattened, the, the smoothened part of the heart, like the sinus of the atrium anyway. So sinoatrial node, it, it, mm, embryology. So the sinoatrial node is found in the wall of the right atrium, like superiorly and laterally. And when they trigger an action potential, that action potential is carried around the wall of muscle of the atrium, around the right atrium and the left atrium back here, and they're conducted by the, the myocytes, the, the muscle cells, the cardiac muscle cells. And that causes both atria to contract and squeeze and push the blood through the two atrioventricular valves and into the two ventricles. So that's the first part. Now that wave of excitation runs also to a second node, the atrioventricular node. And this is found in, so the, the wall between the two atria, so the interatrial septum, it's found in there, the atrioventricular node or the AV node, or maybe the secondary pacemaker of the heart. It's kind of a banana shaped structure. And again, in here, we have specialized myocytes capable 
of depolarizing and depolar just continuing to depolarize and produce action potentials and, and so on and so on. And they will produce action potentials at a rate of about 60 to 80 per minute if they're not receiving um, action potentials from the sinoatrial node. But normally the sinoatrial node triggers action potentials, causes contraction of the atria, that signal reaches, reaches the atrioventricular node and then continues from there. Now, the, I don't know if you can see, but the, the valves of the heart are all on the same plane. And they are supported by a fibrous skeleton, which makes sense because we need to, these valves are very structural things. They couldn't, if they were holes, you wouldn't want them to collapse. So they're held open and held in place by a fibrous skeleton. And that fibrous skeleton is also an electrical insulator. So the, the action potentials, the contraction of the atria will not continue past the fibrous skeleton of the heart into the ventricles because this insulator is, exists. So the job of the atrioventricular node and the fibers passing from it is to carry that action potential, that electrical impulse from the AV node through the fibrous skeleton of the heart and into the ventricles. And that is the only route it can take, so it must work. The atrioventricular node is in the wall, the septum between the two atria and its inferior and posterior. So it's essentially close to the ventricles, which makes sense. And the other thing that the atrioventricular node can do is it can induce a delay which means that the atria contract and then there is a delay and then the ventricles contract, which is really important. We want the atria to squeeze the blood into relaxed ventricles and then we want the ventricles to squeeze the blood out through the main vessels. Now from the atrioventricular node, we see a bundle of more specialized cardiac myocytes that are gonna carry action potentials from the AV node through the septum between the two ventricles, so through the interventricular septum. This is the AV bundle, or the atrioventricular bundle, or the bundle of Hiss, uh, and that carries the action potentials out to the septum and then splits into two uh, right and left bundles. And look, they're running towards the apex of the heart again and then around the ventricular muscle. So these fibers here are the subendocardial fibers, also known as the Purkinje fibers. I'm sure there's a much better pronunciation of that out there, but that's, that's what I've always been taught and said. Anyway, so the Purkinje fibers. Now, these bundles of Hiss are insulated so as the action potentials run down or are carried down the interventricular septum, they're not triggering the ventricles to contract yet. They're carrying the action potentials to the subendocardial fibers. And then those subendocardial fibers, they carry the action potentials to the papillary muscles. Those are the ones hanging onto the, the heartstrings, the cordy, tendony and the valves, and also to the ventricular muscles. So what happens is, is that the atrioventricular node triggers contraction of the ventricles, those action potentials are carried down to the apex of the heart-ish, and then they, they trigger the ventricles, the ventricles to contract. And look, that makes complete sense, because you want to contract from the bottom up. You want to wring the heart out. So the ventricles are filled with blood, wring them out, so they push the blood up superiorly and out through the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. So that's what's going on there. That's why this anatomy is important. Is that how you would have built it? Is that what you were thinking when I said, how would you wire this up to get it to do that? Um, so that describes the conduction of electrical impulses around the heart and the organization of atria contracting, then ventricles contracting, then atria contracting, then ventricles contracting. But the heart is wired up to the autonomic nervous system. And the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions of the autonomic nervous system can interact with both the SA node and the AV node. 
and sympathetic innervation will cause your heart rate to increase. It will cause more rapid depolarization. It will cause action potentials to be released more often, so your heart beats faster. And parasympathetic innervation from the vagus nerve will do the opposite. That will cause your heart rate to slow down. That will cause the number of action potentials to be generated by the SA node to decrease. And that's what you're doing right now. If you're sat at home or sat somewhere, not burning a lot of energy, watching YouTube videos, your heart rate isn't at the standard rate of 100 beats per minute generated by the SA node. It's at probably 60 to 80 beats per minute because the parasympathetic innovation is dampening the SA node and making it produce action potentials more slowly so that your heart beats more slowly. Now, given that you know the anatomy of the conducting system of the heart, what would happen if any of those bits stopped working? What would happen if the SA node stopped working? What would you see the atria do maybe? What would happen if the AV node stopped working? What would happen if the bundles of Hiss didn't transmit action potentials from the atria to the ventricles? Have a think. I'm not gonna talk about it now, but maybe we'll go over that in a future video but that's the normal anatomy of the electrical conduction system of the heart, as you might describe it. And amazingly, that's all specialized muscle cells doing that, rather than neurons. It's just cool, isn't it? The heart, amazing. Uh, and um, you kind of take it to granted, for granted until you get to my age, and then you, you start thinking, oh, I'm a middle-aged man. I really need to look after my heart, which if you watch my vlogs, you know that I do. Anyway, okay, there we go. Anatomy done. See you next week. Mm -hmm.